For those of you who don't know, I'm Dan Barker and I am the Reform UK candidate for Blackpool North and Fleetwood. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And um, I'm not a career politician and, you know, two years ago, just under two years ago, I wasn't even involved in politics. And I've always been interested in politics, but I wasn't involved. And I would class myself as someone who is the silent majority, like most people out there, and like a lot of our supporters are, I would say, from that sort of group. Um, the reason that I got involved in politics and decided that I couldn't just sit on the sidelines anymore is because I was sick of seeing politicians and the liberal elite running our country down and eroding our freedoms on one item of political correctness after another. And I'm, I'm nearly 50 and I've got two grown up kids, I'm married and, um, and I looked at my children and I saw that the opportunities they have now aren't as good as when I was their age. And I do fear what my grandchildren, when they come one day, what their opportunities will be. And so I wanted to make sure that their opportunities were better than mine. And as I said, I, I've not been in politics long, but one thing I have noticed is that things can change very fast and anything is possible. And I think this, the moment we're in now uh, and this general election is a very important moment for the UK. And I would say it's the most important election we've seen in recent times. Whether you realise it or not, what's happening with reform, what's happening with the Conservative Party and the fact that Labour have had such high poll ratings for so long, yet in reality, the only reason why they are so popular is because they're not the Tory party. And I find that state of uh, affairs very troubling because we don't really know what Labour stand for or what they are going to do. We don't really know what, what Keir Starmer stands for. You know, he's been in opposition for so long and he's done so many U-turns. How is he going to do under the pressure of government? For me, that's an open question and I, I haven't got much confidence in him, I'll be honest. And I think after 27 years of Labour and the Tories and the country, I think most people would regard it as being quite a mess. You know, this is the stuff we're dealing with now uh, has been coming for a long time. And I think this is the election where people are really going to speak up about it when they vote on the 4th of July. And this is the first time that we've had a real choice, I would say. Because it's the first time, rather than it just being a choice between Tories or Labour, or Labour and Tories, we now have a possibility to change direction by choosing Reform UK. Yeah, yeah. Now sadly, Labour has won the election. And yeah. what's really at stake now is the size of their majority and perhaps more importantly, who will be the voice of opposition. Now, if it's the Lib Dems, because they're forecast to get quite a few seats in the South East and South West, I think you'll find that will just be an echo chamber. They're basically on the same page and they agree on, on pretty much the same stuff. So, so they're no good as an opposition party. And then you've got the Tories, who are so broken and divided and worn out, and there's no way, as soon as this election is passed, whatever's left of them is going to be at war with each other. So they can't be the voice of opposition. And then we have Reform UK. Hey. And we are a party that's full of energy and ideas, and we have something to say. And we have a leader who has got a track record of holding rotten politicians and rotten policies to account in the public. So I would say, the question is, who is going to call out the bad ideas that we're going to get under this Labour government? Who is going to call out the waste, the obsession with race and minority rights, the wokery, and who will offer an alternative vision for the UK? And I firmly believe that that party is Reform UK. 
Now my vision for Blackpool North and Fleetwood, it's very simple, but I do admit it's ambitious. So working with hopefully Mark Butcher in Blackpool South, we will deliver a plan to boost the economy and give year-round jobs to the Fylde Coast. And first of all, and I'll let Mark talk more about these two things. First of all, we'll be reopening Blackpool Airport. The second thing will be bringing a film studio to the Fylde Coast. And we, you know, the UK is really successful at making TV and films, and we want a slice of that here. For Fleetwood, you know, a town that's been forgotten about for decades and left behind. You know, a town, when you look around, it's got such great bones, such great buildings, it's had such a great history, a great past, you know, and I just see this, the politicians in the last 20 years have had no vision apart from giving people handouts and then forgetting about them. And I want to bring the fishing back to Fleetwood. <laughs> Because one job at sea is worth eight jobs on land. So they don't, we don't need levelling up, we need jobs. And we need people to get back and have something for their families, for their kids, and a future, and a reason to stay in Fleetwood. I also think it's a travesty that the Fleetwood is one of the few, possibly the only major town in uh, England and the UK, that hasn't got a rail link. You know, and that's another you know, disability for the town. And uh, so I want to see that rail link from Poulton to Fleet to Fleetwood reconnected. <laughs> and then finally, the last couple of things is, and I'll, and I'll hand over to Mark, is, you know, and this is a, something that I know resonates with everybody uh, about tackling antisocial behaviour and crime. And, you know, we are the party of law and order, backing our police to do the job, getting politics out of the police, getting rid of two-tier policing, and, and a zero-tolerance approach to police in this, in this area of England. And we're also about protecting pensioners. I mean, there's a lot, there's a high percentage of pensioners in this area. And so we are, we are, our party policy, which I fully support, is about protecting the triple lock and taking a serious look at the travesty of social care and working out how we're going to deal with it. Because just saying it's a problem and not admitting that we need to spend more money on it is ducking the issue. Well, thank you very much. So, so that's my plan for Blackpool North Fleetwood. Um, I thank you for listening. I shall hand you over to Mark. Thank you, Dan. Fantastic candidate, isn't he, Dan Barker? For, 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 for Blackpool North and Fleetwood. So my name is Mark Butcher, and I'm the candidate for Blackpool South. And um, yeah, it's great to be here. I know we're just a warm-up act um, for Anne, so I'll keep it brief. Uh, I won't try not to repeat anything that Dan said to you, other than I will say this, I don't want to start with bad news, but I'm afraid on the 5th of July, we are going to be handing the keys to number 10 to Keir Starmer. Get ready for Starmageddon. Yeah. Get ready for Starmageddon. It's coming. And like Dan says, who's going to be the opposition to this? Who's going to stand against them? And a miracle might happen, eh? 17.4 million might come out, eh? We'll take the government as well. So it's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Um, you know, it's humbling really to be given this amazing opportunity to speak for all of you, really. Um, to, to be the person who's the voice of the residents of, of Blackpool South. And um, it's been exciting. You know, we've had a smile. The doors, people have been talking on the doors. The, the momentum is with Reform UK. And we're seeing it and we're hearing it on the doors. It's very exciting, but we're trying to keep our feet on the ground. And we're chasing this labour. We are looking 
to win this seat here in Blackpool South. I intend to win this seat. I'm not looking for second place. My dad brought me up, there was no such thing as second place in my house. There was only one winner. And that's what it's going to be. We're going for the win. We're going to take this seat back and we're going to give Chris Webb the title of the shortest reigning MP ever. It's wonderful to see some of the candidates here. Brooke uh, as well from Fylde, another fantastic candidate. Get behind Brooke. Wonderful lad. On the Fylde coast, fighting a good fight. So I want to talk about just briefly some of the things about Blackpool South. And Dan's mentioned some of that. And the, the, obviously the, the, the great idea for the major film studio is something that we are really pushing. And the good thing about the film studio is it brings jobs all year round, and it brings in massive investment into the town, and it puts Blackpool on the map. And the worldwide map as well. And this will be a film studio for hire. So we build the film studio, hangar type, type film studio, and they come in and out and turn these from a Star Wars film set one day to a Spider-Man film set the next. They do it very, very quickly. They, they employ local people and they bring a lot of investment and jobs all year round. Now the thing is that the culture secretary has a budget of 40 billion. Not million, billion. Just let that sink in for a minute. 40 billion pound at arts and culture secretary. So why is it that the, all the infrastructure has been built in the north and west London? Why is everything happening in London? Nothing's happening up here. We've got no physical infrastructure. So we're not even in the game. We can't apply for the movie lottery grants because we don't have a film studio. Once we've got a film studio in place, the physical infrastructure for hire, Netflix, all of the Universal, all of the big film companies will be very interested to come to Blackpool. We've got an already wonderful film set built. We've got the tower, the, the piers, the seven miles of Golden Promenade. It's a film set already built, ready to go. We've got Fleetwood that could be turned into a Scottish village in no time at all. You could, you could do something fantastic on, at Lidham and on the promenade there. And the cafes, the culture there would be ideal for filmmakers to come and make these movies. Small movies and large movies. And then we can apply for the lottery funding on top of the culture secretary budget. We can then apply for large film lottery grants or small film lottery grants. And also, you've got the private investors who would come in their droves to Blackpool. They'll be fighting to take the film studio. They will be hiring it for three months at a time. So, jobs, jobs, and more jobs for Blackpool. That's what we want to see. The residents of this town want all year round jobs. We want our airport back open, which Dan has already been clear about. We want a light rail link that runs on the Waterloo train line. And this should be called our airport line. Why is that not called our airport line? It stops at the airport, but the Blackpool Council, and in their wisdom, have called the Squires Gate station, Squires Gate. It should be called the airport. And it should call at St. Anne's, Lytham, Kirkham, and off to East Lancashire, and so on. We want jobs all year round, we want investment into the town, we want to see this council tax situation is becoming totally ridiculous. We are paying council tax on par with Chelsea and Kensington. It's, 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 it's outrageous to see that we in the north up here are paying similar council taxes to people who live in three and four million pound houses. But yet we're paying more. How does that work? We want an independent review. We're going to do this and we're going to call for an independent review on the council tax situation. Why are we paying the, the more than Kensington and Chelsea? And we are, our houses are worth 10 times less than theirs. So that's something we're really going to push for. Again, these things are the, what the residents have been asking me to do. I'm not coming on here with an agenda of my own, although the film studio is something that we're really passionate about, and the airport. But this is what people are complaining about. This is what people are getting worried about. And Dan's mentioned it, the antisocial behaviour. 
the, 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 the people of old ladies, people, of senior citizens of the of, of certain ward, I don't want to mention it, are getting terrorised. Yeah. And I'm seeing it and hearing it, and this is something we must stamp out. And like Dan says, we fall are the only party that's committed to working with the police, 40,000 more police officers. It's, it's, this is something that we need to change and we need to take this opportunity to change it now. There's many more things I could talk about tonight, but I've just, like I said, I've just a warm-up back for the wonderful Anne Whittaker, who's come to talk to you tonight, and, and also some questions at the end as well. Uh, but we're going to keep that as brief as we can, and that will be something for Anne to just work with as she goes. So for now, I'm just going to leave it at that, but thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak to you all. Get out and vote for the Reform UK. Become part of the revolt. That's what I want to say. Let's get this momentum on the ground. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, please let me know what you say. I'm going to get some Testing, testing. <laughs> Your mic doesn't work. Uh, it's a very great pleasure to be here today, ladies and gentlemen. Now, reform are going to win, aren't they? Yeah. Hmm. That wasn't too bad. <laughs> but that will only guarantee that we make the opposition. So let me ask you again, this time I'd like you to think of government. Reform are going to win, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> Now uh, that's it. And that's the level of energy which we have to keep up if we are going to win on Thursday week. Yeah. And we have to keep it up until 10 o'clock on Thursday week. And at 10.01 it's too late. And what we haven't done by that time we won't be able to do. And there is absolutely everything, everything to play for. We're ahead of the Tories now in the polls. Yeah. That means we are the effective opposition. And if we, if we can build on that, then when the election is over, we can become the real parliamentary opposition. And that is what we need. And then we can hold Starmageddon to account. And then we can build on the sort of Britain that we want until at the next general election, which can't be any later than 2029, at that general election, we don't worry about being the opposition, we will be the government. Yeah. And we will be the government for one very simple reason. We are the only party, and I do mean this, the only party that is basing our policies on just two words, common sense. Yeah. Let's look at the health service. We have known for years, and successive Conservative Prime Ministers, they've had so many I've nearly lost track, but successive Conservative Prime Ministers have said, we haven't got enough doctors. Okay, we haven't got enough doctors. What do you do if you haven't got enough doctors? You train more doctors. And yet this government has operated a cap on the numbers of doctors in training, and it has not raised that cap. And now suddenly at the gates of the general election, it says, oh dear, we better say we're going to train more doctors. Well, why didn't they do it when they had the chance? And the answer to that is a lack of sense. Now, common sense says you haven't got enough doctors, you need more. So reform will not put any cap on the numbers of doctors in training. Or, all we will 
require is that they are sufficiently able to take on that course. That is all we will require. But that won't be the end of the matter. Because it isn't just recruitment, it's also retention. The poor souls leave the NHS as fast as they can. What we've got to do is to keep doctors in the NHS. So what does common sense say? It says, well, if you want to encourage a particular pattern of behaviour, you offer an incentive to people to behave in that way. So therefore our policy is that if a doctor has qualified and then gives us 10 full years in the NHS after qualification, we will remit all that doctor's student debt. And which means that they will have trained for free. That is what you do if you want to encourage people not only to join the NHS, but to stay in it. And we make a similar offer to nurses and patient-facing frontline workers, not the chaps setting the targets, but the people actually delivering health services. We have said that providing they give us five full years in the NHS, we will then remit three years' worth of taxes. Now, that is worth having. And while we're on the subject of student debt, where is the common sense in running a system where up to 80%, 80% of students never repay their debt? And the reason they don't repay it is not because they're feckless, it's because that debt increases with an interest rate of 7%. And it becomes impossible to pay it off and to run a mortgage and a family and all the other responsibilities that people have. So we have said we cannot afford and we will not promise, unlike some other parties, we will not promise to abolish student tuition fees, but what we will abolish is the interest on those fees. So that students will leave university owing X amount of money, and that amount of money will never increase. And that seems to me, again, very, very basic common sense. Now let's look at immigration. <laughs> Rishi Shunak, he has a plan. He's had a plan ever since he's been Prime Minister. It's called Rwanda. The only problem with this plan is it hasn't been translated into any action. And yet he's still promising Rwanda. Now, common sense says, that's fine. You can have that as your plan A. But common sense says, if plan A is being derailed, you go for a plan B. So reform offers both a plan A and a plan B. Plan A is to stop the boats at the point, at, the point at which they're about to enter British waters. And we are entitled in international law to refuse entry to our waters to anybody who is endeavouring to enter them without our permission. So it can already be done. <laughs> ah, say the naysayers. Well, you may be entitled to do it, but actually it's impossible. If it's so impossible, why did Australia do it? If it's so impossible, how did Belgium do it? Uh, if it is possible for other countries to do it, it is possible for us to do it, if only we have the will to do it. <laughs> but we're sensible. And we say, OK, some of those votes will still get through. Well, we're not just going to sit back and let it happen. We've got a plan B. 
And plan B is that if they do arrive here unlawfully, we will house them not in hotels from which they can come and go, but in secure reception centres so that we know where they are. And we can process them that much more quickly because we know where they are and we can deal with queries on the spot. And then the message that goes out will be if you come to Britain with a false claim, you will be detained, you will be dealt with quickly, you will be sent back, and nobody's going to pay £15,000 to a human trafficking agency for that. So yes, it can be done. It won't be done by Tuesday afternoon, but it will be done quickly. Uh, and it will be done with will and with determination. And then where is the common sense in teaching children that there are 142 genders? <laughs> when they're only ever going to meet two of them. <laughs> there is no sense in that at all. And what a distortion of education it is to teach children what to think rather than how to think. For example, for example, when schools are teaching the history of the British Empire, you teach the pupils the good things, you teach them the bad things, and you let them perform the analysis to decide what they think. That's education. That is real, rigorous education. And that is what we need in our schools. And common sense says that making a travesty of education is actually not a sound investment in Britain's future. We need bright, well-educated, rigorously thinking future generations. Yeah. And again, that's not something that we can deliver by Tuesday afternoon, but it jolly well is something that we can deliver fairly quickly, because we will take control uh, of what is being taught and we will restore the supremacy of parents when it comes to delivering sex education, particularly to primary school children. <laughs> so all these things are based on common sense, but the other thing we're going to have a look at is equality, diversity, and inclusion. Equality is a very funny thing. Why is it that the gender equality laws protect women but not men? Why is it that the racial equality laws protect blacks but not whites? Why is it that the religious equality laws protect everybody except Christians? <laughs> if you are white, male and Christian, you should be absolutely equal in a true democracy to somebody who is black, female, and of another religion. And we will see that equality actually means that. And one of the ways we'll do that is to get rid of all those posts in the civil service and elsewhere which call themselves equality, diversity, and inclusion and take up millions in resources to deliver grievance. That is what we will do. So we have a programme for Britain, and where is the common sense in saying, we want to get everybody working, oh, but we're going to tax you up to the eyebrows. Where is the sense in that? If you want people to work, you've got to provide the incentive to work. So, as I think is very well known, reform will raise the basic tax threshold to £20,000. And 
that won't just benefit young people and modest earners, it will also benefit pensioners who at the moment, if they've got the state pension plus, even a very modest occupational pension, can find they're in the tax bracket. So uh, we will make sure that that cannot happen. And that is delivering a fair society. And that is what we're about. We're about fairness. We're about true equality. We're about a true democracy, which means freedom of speech. It means that whether somebody is left-wing or centre or right-wing, as long as they are not trying to incite violence, they can state what they think. And how can it be just? How can we talk about impartial justice when somebody can be charged with a racially aggravated crime or a religiously aggravated crime or whatever it might be based solely on the perception of the complainant with no objective evidence? That's not justice and we'll get rid of that pretty quickly too. That can be done with a very simple uh, change to the legal definitions. So all these things can be done, but we're going to do something else as well. Do you remember something called Brexit? Yeah. Anybody know where Brexit is now? <laughs> Northern Ireland is still subject to vast tranches of EU law. We are still subject to tranches of EU law which haven't been repealed. We, for some reason, which I don't understand, this government has shadowed the EU rather than competed with it. The first thing that Hunt and Shunak did when they took office was to put up the level of corporation tax to that of France. Why didn't they reduce it to that of the Irish Republic? It would have been much more sensible. And round here, do you really think we've taken back control of our waters? No. We haven't. And um, what we have to do, we decide, and we alone decide who fishes in our waters. <laughs> and when I say we alone, we alone, that is to say Britain, and therefore the British government, must decide on British policy and not be compelled by the World Economic Forum or the World Health Organization. We decide, or our elected government decides, what is best for Britain, and the British people can then decide whether they're right or wrong at the next election. And that is what we wanted from Brexit. Britain running her own affairs. And we still haven't got it. So we'll be doing that as well. Now, I've said several times in the course of this address that we're not going to be able to do all those things on our first day in Parliament, particularly as we will not be the government. But we can start to build on all of that in the minds of the British people. We can start to tell people what it is they have a complete right to expect. And that is what we will fight for in Parliament. Now, there's no doubt this time we're going to get seats. We're going to have a parliamentary presence. <coughs> and, that, <laughs> and that will give us the power on which to form the basis on which we can then build. Now, whether we do deals with any other party or not depends entirely on what those other parties are offering. And what we do know is we're not going to do any deals with a Conservative Party that pursues its present course. That is absolutely <laughs> fundamental. So, I'm not going to say to you, uh, go to your constituencies and prepare for government. 
but I am going to say, go to your constituencies and prepare for opposition. Right, questions from anybody at all? And if you want to ask a candidate, just tell me. I'm going to go sir and then madam and then sir. Sir here first. Yes, you sir, there. You, yes. Yes. It's going to be cut because we won't be spending it. Yes. The amount that we we're giving away because of taxes. And yes, we're going to provide so much more to the country. Yes. As a common sense person, do you believe the number around? Yes. Uh, the question for those of you who may not heard at the very back is do I think the numbers add up? That is to say, can we fund the promises that I'm standing here making? We are not Liz Truss. We have seen what happened to Liz Trust, who just placed all her hope in growth. And so, therefore, we have fully costed the sum of our policies, and we have identified quite clearly how we're going to pay for them. And the biggest source of funding, not the only one, but the biggest source, is very simple, but it's also very complicated. Uh, after uh, COVID, Britain was faced, as everybody knows, with trillions of pounds worth of debt. And the way the government <coughs> managed that situation was that they printed money. We all know they don't call it that. They call it quantitative easing. It means they printed money. But then, for some extraordinary reason, which reform can't understand, they let the banks issue those bonds and then paid the banks interest on the bonds. Now, as Richard Tice has said, it's a bit like giving somebody a fiver and then saying, oh, and how much interest would you like me to pay on it? And that's exactly what the government has done. Now, before you say, we can't reverse that, oh, yes, we can. Switzerland reversed it. The European Bank reversed it. The European Bank, mark you. And even the mighty, the infallible, the uncontradictable Robert Peston says it can be done. <laughs> and of course, if he says it can be done, well, it must be able to be done, must it? <laughs> but the fact is, we've got solid precedents for other very large, wealthy countries that have done it. Uh, so we can do it. And that is where most, not all, but most of the, uh, the savings will be made. So it's OK, sir, we're not promising jam tomorrow without a clue how we're going to bake the scone underneath it. It's OK. <laughs> right, now there's a lady. Yep. What I'd like to ask is you do on the fact, I read a couple of weeks ago, that uh, Starmer had been asked if he would accept Palestine as an independent state yeah. to appease the Muslim voters. There were 17 points that um, were given to him. One being, would he accept Palestine as an independent state to appease the yeah. Muslim vote? Well, I mean, the, it, it's not just a question of appeasement. It's a question of trying to get a long-lasting solution. Uh, and most politicians start, and I'm talking now about international um, uh, uh, discussions, most politicians start uh, with the proposition that there should be a two-state solution. Your problem then is identifying and defining the two states. Uh, so it's actually quite complex. Um, but, uh, and I don't think Starmer is out of step in that sense, but I think where he's very badly out of step is he hasn't condemned the marches and the growth of anti-Semitism. <laughs> And we know he does have problems of definition. He seriously believes, because he told us, that 10% of women have a male appendage. <laughs> he must believe that because he told us that 90% of women don't. <laughs> I mean, actually, we all laugh, and I can understand why. But he's going into number 10. 
He's going to be the British Prime Minister. He doesn't know what a woman is, and God help us. Right, okay. Sir, over there. Okay, um, first of all, uh, let's start uh, with the question of reform drawing largely from Conservatives. Now, because there is such a lot of disillusionment with the Conservatives at the moment, it is quite undeniable that a large proportion of those coming to us come from reform. But it's also, sorry, coming to reform come from the Tories. But it's also the case, quite demonstrably the case, uh, that many are also coming from Labour. Think back to Mrs Thatcher. And then think back, um, you know, a, a lot less in terms of time past, and think of Boris. And think of the two things that they did. Mrs. Thatcher could never have got the majorities that she got if she had not been supported by what is often called the ordinary working man. She couldn't have done it. She needed their support, and she got it because they knew that she was on the side of their aspirations. She wanted them to be able to buy their own houses. She wanted their children to be able to go to independent schools if they were bright enough to benefit from it. She wanted ordinary people to own shares in British businesses. She wanted those things not to be the preserve of the elite. And Boris had a very similar appeal to what is called the Red Wall. Uh, his appeal was different. He was going for two things, one Brexit and two levelling up. Now, it is perfectly possible to appeal way beyond the Conservative ranks, and that is what we're doing, and that particularly is what Nigel Farage is doing. Because Nigel Farage... <laughs> you don't look at Nigel Farage and think, ah, oh, yes, metropolitan elite. That is what you think when you look at David Cameron. Yeah. It's not something you think when you look at Nigel Farage. So yes, we are drawing from Labour. We are drawing very heavily from the Tories because they're so fed up. But we are also are drawing from Labour. And I think you'll find that over the course of the next week, we do try to emphasise rather more what our appeal is uh, to uh, former Labour supporters. Okay, anybody else? Yes, sir, there. Right. Um, the question, for those of you who may not have heard it at the back, is about sectarianism. Uh, it's about the growth of sectarianism, the growth of Islamic fundamentalism. Yeah, I know, I know what you're saying, sir, but it's all part of sectarianism. Um, I mean, just look at the Palestine marches. It's all part of sectarianism uh, and uh, Islamic fundamentalism. Now, let me say this. You know, it is crucial that we recognise that Britain is absolutely full of many perfectly decent Muslims who could actually teach us quite a lot when it comes to family values. <laughs> but we also know that there is another, and I think you're right, growing section uh, which doesn't share our values, which doesn't want to share our values, um, and which is extremely militant. Now, I speak with feeling I have Muslim friends, I'm going to one of their weddings uh, in, in a few days' time, uh, but I also had my best friend murdered by an Islamic fundamentalist. So I've seen it from both sides, uh, and I just don't want to deny the first in addressing the second. 
frankly, when it comes to addressing fundamentalism, you've got to meet it head on. There's no good prevaricating. And the PREVENT program does a bit too much prevarication. prevarication. It does a bit too much of it. Uh, so, I mean, I think you meet it head on. Uh, and I think you challenge it when you meet it. I think you'd be very alert for it in the schools, which is where you know, it becomes uh, obvious. You're alert for it in some of the mosques. Uh, and we challenge it where it occurs. Um, I don't want this country to become sectarian. Uh, and that is what will happen if we allow the growth of one particular very extreme view. <laughs> Sorry, sir, you also asked me about mental health. And you were going to raise your hand at the end and say, you don't care about mental health, do you? You didn't answer me. Uh, so uh, let, let, me, let me answer you now. Uh, Yes, of course, mental health is important. Uh, and what we're doing with the health service in general will mean that we are able uh, to expand those services. But let me also say this. I am tired of hearing, and I say this on behalf of people who do have real mental health problems, I'm tired of hearing every little stress described as mental health problems. We've got to be tougher than that. Stress is a part of ordinary life. We all suffer it, and when we do, we're not having a mental health problem, we're having stress. Uh, and it's as, it's as normal as that. And actually, you know, I mean, I, I really did take exception. I wrote about it in my Express column, very good column every Wednesday in the Daily Express. <laughs> I wrote about it when Prince William, referring to his father's uh, having to shield uh, for uh, less than a week uh, because he tested positive for COVID. Uh, and Prince William said, oh, it's bad for his mental health. Okay. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. You know, a whole lot of us had to shield from time to time. It wasn't bad for our mental health. Actually, gave me some much needed time off and I could get things done. <laughs> I'm sure his majesty would love some of that. So, uh, it, you know, I, it, we need to keep it in proportion, but you're right, it's important where it's meaningful. Right, okay, yes. I don't know whether you're all clear, but less than half a mile from here. Less than half of half a mile from this from this place. British taxpayer is paying for two hundred and fifty Afghan interpreters. Yes. Some of whom actually speak in English. In Portico below the the uh, Metropole Hotel are British yeah. yeah. Right. Okay, but first, before I turn my attention to the veterans, uh, let me just comment on Afghan interpreters. And let me say very clearly, I said this in my Express column as well, we let down the Afghan interpreters. We had years in which to sort out those who were in danger and to get them over here in an orderly, organised fashion. We didn't jolly well do it. Uh, and what then happened was that America pulled out at the last moment, and we had that massive panic. Do you remember the pictures of the planes and people? To, and, you know, you hadn't even tested the bona fides of all the people because we hadn't done it in an organised fashion. Our fault. Our fault entirely. And I said it not once, not twice, but probably a dozen times in my Express column throughout those years. What are we doing about the people who put their lives on the line for us? And unlike, unlike most asylum seekers, they're very identifiable because their commanding officers would know who they were. Yeah. You, know, you could identify them, and we didn't do it. We didn't do it, and we had a, a, a huge disorganised chaos at the end uh, in which some of those who were utterly genuine were left behind to the mercy of the Taliban. So I'm not proud of our record on that score. Uh, but what I am not proud of as well is the way that we treat our veterans. And we treat them appallingly. <laughs> you, sir, talked about mental health. The mental health crisis among veterans uh, has to be seen to be believed. Now, it's bad enough 
you know, to have been through what they've been through, some of whom manage it, some don't. But it's bad enough to have been through that without then finding that you're in a, a society which actually doesn't care tuppence. Doesn't care tuppence. Uh, and that is something we have to address. It's something Nigel Farage has said very clearly we will address. Um, we will, A, address the depleted state of our armed services. Um, and, of course, one of the reasons... And one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why people don't want to join up is that they don't believe we'll look after them properly afterwards. And it's as simple as that. Uh, I have... Sorry, were you addressing me? Maybe. <laughs> I... I have a great nephew, by which I mean he is my great nephew, not that I have a nephew who is great. Uh, I have a great nephew who wants to be, uh, he's now doing A-levels, he wants to be a combat medic. I think that is a fantastic ambition. But I also know that if anything does go wrong, and if he is in action, and if anything goes wrong subsequently, he's got family backup and not everybody has that, and we need to be aware of it. Now, what I'm going to do, because I've been told to shut up by that chap over there, um, <laughs> what I'm going to do is to ask if there's anybody else who wants to ask a question, and then I'm going to take them all together, so don't ask too many. Uh, who would like, what, now, I'm going to give you numbers, don't cheat. One, two, three, and four. Number one, your question. Well, as I've already said, you know, reform does not believe in globalisation, and we will uh, decide ourselves how we deal with future pandemics. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't bind Starmer to that, but we can reverse what he does. <laughs> two, 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 two. Uh, very, very soon. It's easy enough, you repudiate the treaty. Uh, you know, it was formed for a completely different set of circumstances from the one we've got now. We were instrumental in its formation. It was a different world. Yeah. Now we can say enough. We're going to have to say enough to a lot of things. Yes. Three. <laughs> three. Come on, sir, three. <laughs> Sorry. How do we stop Starmer giving the vote to EU citizens so he can get us back in the EU? You can't stop Starmer from A, giving the vote to 16 year olds. No, not 16. I know, I know. I've said A. A, giving the vote to 16 year olds. <laughs> and B, giving the vote to EU citizens. And C, giving the vote to anybody else he wants to. You can't actually stop a government from doing that. You don't need a referendum to do it. Uh, and it is very hard, I mean the EU citizens bit is not so hard, but it will be immensely hard to turn round a government of the future, to turn round and say to 16 year olds, we're taking away your vote. Yeah, I know, I, I, of course he is, of course he is. He has said very clearly that we won't formally rejoin the EU, but as I've always said, there are two ways of rejoining. One is formally, which we're never going to do, because we'd have to have the euro and everything else. But the second is simply by shadowing the EU and by accepting its laws. And for that, you don't need a referendum. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. So we're going to get it. We're going to get that from Starmer. But in 2029, when you have a reform government, that we can reverse. Four and there. Well, as I've said, you know, there is no such thing as a treaty which cannot be repudiated. You know, there is no such thing. 
uh, and therefore we will have to get out. It will be a bit more subtle than that. We won't just arrive and say, all these treaties are torn up and here's a bumper. Uh, but we will say, you know, we're ending this, and now let's work out how we end it, and end it quickly. We'll do that, we'll do that. I've got so many people claiming to be five. Five. Okay, sir, five and a half, but can I just take five first? Yeah, quick, 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 otherwise we'll all be thrown out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot happened over the pandemic years. Um, I'm just wanting to offer my thoughts and opinions. Could you do it very quickly? Well, what Boris Johnson is doing right now is earning money. That's what he's doing right now. Um, what his future plans are politically, I don't know. Can I just take that as a comment? And five and a half, you are the last one. Okay. Um, I think we all agree the welfare state has grown to such a size yeah. that it's becoming increasingly a drain on the national resources. Yes. I haven't got long enough to go into the sort, of, the sort of detail that I would like to go into, but let me put it this way. Our National Health Service is a 1940s institution trying to cope with the 2024 situation, and it isn't geared up to it. It never was. I mean, Bevan did not realise that longevity was about to increase from 69 years for a woman to today's 83. He didn't know that there would be replacements for all manner of joints. He didn't know that we would gradually get treatment for cancer. He didn't know those things. And so the system he designed was designed for the 1940s. And I've been saying for years, sir, and I say it again, that, and, and, and I do mean years, about 30 years I've been saying this quite publicly, what we need is a proper debate asking a very simple question, but which won't produce a simple answer, which is, if we were starting again now, knowing what we know now, how would we shape a national health service? And finally, in response to your question about those who can afford it, one of our problems is that we have, over the years, come to confuse Bevan's vision with the vehicle he chose to deliver it. The vision, I'm sure we all share, Nobody should ever be denied health services simply because they can't afford it. The vehicle he chose to deliver that was therefore everything free at the point of reception. That vehicle has broken down and we need to work out how to fix it without losing the vision. Very much. Can we just have another round of applause for our yeah, yeah, yeah. amazing yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. So, we'll just briefly finish off um, for Mark and myself, Blackpool South, Blackpool North. Uh, thank you to all those who are supporting us at the moment with volunteering. We really need your help and it's really appreciated. Yep. If any of you would like to get involved and you're not already, please come and see us after this uh, event closes. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Wonderful. And thanks, everybody, for being here. If you want to keep up to date with us, follow us on the social media pages. If there's anything you want to ask, then send the questions out to us if you don't get to us today. Dan and I are very accessible. Uh, what you've got to do is send us your number if you want a phone call. 
you know, if you want to come and help us, you can get involved in coming out, canvassing with us. It's been very exciting speaking to the residents. It really does give you a great understanding of where we are. So thanks everybody, thank you for being here. Thanks for the support and all the staff. And Spencer and all the guys who helped out. Thank you very much.